may or may not recognise me. I normally scoot out when the music finishes and um, hang out with the youth. We've got some awesome teenagers here, which is great. And um, with my lovely wife, Lisa. Lisa, your little wife. Yes, and daughter Amy over there. You need to meet Amy and get to know her story. I've got two other kids who are sick and at home at the moment. But um, we've loved getting to know some of you guys and being part of this community. And yeah, like Don said, we are in the process of seeking God about church planning, which is awesome. Um, and it's my privilege to bring the word about our word grace today, the greatest, I think, one of the greatest words we can have and know in our scriptures. I'm going to invite our resident Bible scholar, worship leader, and genuine voice of an angel to come and read my scripture for me, because he is all those things and more. No, no pressure. As right, so we're reading from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 today. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Thank you, Chris. It is the, one of the greatest portions of Scripture we can read. And so I encourage you to have your Bibles out if you have them. Um, to Ephesians we're going to be kind of sitting in this text, um, bouncing around a little bit. But um, I don't know what you're doing in January 2007, but uh, on that date, a famous violinist took his $3.5 million Stradivarius, it's fun to say, say Stradivarius, Stradivarius violin to a platform in Washington, D.C., this is a famous um, violinist called, I think Josh Bell was his name, and he's used to playing to concert halls and world leaders. Uh, for the price of $1,000 a minute, you can hire Josh Bell to come play for you. But on this day, he decided to take his very expensive violin and just put on a free concert in a subway as passers-by went. People noticed that about 1,000 about people walked past and only five or six actually stopped to pay attention to this precious most expensive uh, free offering that was given to them. Uh, many just walked past. And it is interesting as we contemplate grace, I would say it is the most precious, most expensive gift. And my heart would be this, that today, um, that we would not just let it pass by. Sometimes we get so, um, it's so common, um, so familiar with this term grace, um, that we forget because it's offered freely to us how precious and priceless it actually is. And so that is my heart. In Hebrews, um, the, the author of Hebrews says, that see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And so it's my heart this morning that maybe God by his spirit may generate and, and um, encourage you in the grace of God this morning. So I might just quickly pray as well myself um, as we just settle into this word. Um, Father God, we thank you for this precious word but more than that, the precious act of grace. And that you are a gracious Father. And ask, Father God, that your grace would be regenerating and encouraging and saving and transforming us this morning. Holy Spirit, this is all of your work. And Jesus, all of your blood and life and resurrection. And so we offer ourselves your grace afresh this morning in Jesus' name. So this word grace. Um, John Barclay, a, a New Testament professor and uh, historian, so the Paul uses this, this word grace um, is actually quite a common word for them. As with a lot of these words, the, the words we choose aren't kind of magical sort of special religious words. They're, they're common words. And the word that Paul chose to use um, was this word meaning gift, gift or favor for grace. And in his time, it wasn't uncommon or uncommon around the world to think of God as a God of who is a gift giver. 
Um, they knew that God was the one who sent rain, um, but the perspective that they had was that God, or as they would give grace, was always in proportion with behaviour, always in proportion with people's goodness or, um, or not, or you know, if things are being withheld, that's because there's no grace. And countries would give gifts of grace, you know, if you wanted to, say, connect with a king or build relationship with someone who was like of high status or high in community, you'd give a gift of grace in order to build relationship. People are always sort of looking for someone worthy to be giving grace gifts to. What's so unusual and what's so radical about this grace that we know in Christ is that God gives this gift completely, completely irrelevant to the behaviour to the, the worth, the status of the recipients. This is, this is the word that we use as grace, that God's favour and gift comes to those who don't deserve it. In fact, the craziness is that God actually gives gifts of grace to his enemies, those who hate him, those who have low status. This is an incredible idea of grace. In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans 5, that God shows his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. While we were still at our worst, while we are enemies of God, God bankrupted heaven and gave the most precious of gifts to us while in rebellion. Christ died for us. Therefore, we now have been justified by his blood. How much more will we be saved by the wrath of God from him? This is U2 song. Um, like grace gets used a lot. Um, but you two, the singer Bono wrote a song called Grace. I don't know if any of you two fans in the house, but uh, wrote this song called Grace. You two, um, or Bono himself, a follower of Jesus. And Grace is personified in this, this song as this beautiful woman who walks into a room and just lights up the room. That she's generous in her giving, that she's generous in her acceptance, generous in forgiveness. The idea of kind of like the lady of wisdom that we see in Proverbs, that this person of grace walks in. This is what Bono kind of talks about. Some of the, the lyrics, he says, grace, she takes the blame, she covers, covers our shame. It's a thought that can change the world. When she walks in the street, you can hear her strings. Grace finds goodness in everything. Grace makes beauty out of ugly things. Grace finds beauty in everything. And ask to kind of explain his song, um, Bono obviously refers to his faith, but he talks about this beautiful word grace. He says this, grace is my favourite word and it's a word that I'm depending on. The universal society kind of runs on karma. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But then grace enters and turns that all upside down. Christ's ministry was a lot about pointing out how everyone's kind of a screw-up in some way, shape, or form. There's no way around it. But then Jesus wants to say, I'm going to deal with those sins. I will take that punishment upon myself, the consequences of your sins. The grace is this powerful, beautiful, Incredible person, and I love that. The idea of it's being personified as this person that comes into a room and lifts people, treats people different to what they deserve, to what they've earned. It's a great picture of God's grace. I find this kind of helpful, this analogy, in terms of um, responses to evil, right? I think there are four responses to evil in terms of there's revenge, justice, mercy, and grace. So let's imagine I can see him staring at me right now, James Kosh. Right there. James Crosh annoyed that I've picked him out and decided to use him as an illustration. Sneaks out of the service, keep an eye on for him, please, and decides to take his keys and just key Jason sucks across my 2012 Kia Carnival sitting in the car park. He's the most likely to do it, uh, and that's why I'm letting you know that I'm watching you. I can see you from here. There are probably four different ways I could respond to that. One would be revenge, just so you know. One would be revenge. One could be, I, I get in my key kind of a revenge generally isn't in proportion to what's done, right? It's kind of like eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I would probably get in my, could get in my Kia, 
just back it straight into his car. You've damaged my car. I'm going to damage your car. In retaliation, maybe you'll do something else because we're petty like that, Koshi and I. That would be revenge, right? Not great. Um, Not a great response to evil, but that's part of the world that we live in. What about justice? What would justice look like? Koshi's keyed my car, scraped it all up. Big new paint job on the side. Jason sucks. Um, Justice would be potentially calling the police. That'd be fair enough. Justice would be, hey, buddy, you're going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to make, make good on what you've done. I'm not going to get revenge on you. I'm not going to attack you. But justice would make that right, make that situation right. That's, that's the response of justice. Well, what would mercy look like? Mercy might be, you know, James is like, yeah, do you know what? I was a bit sorry. I just had a no sleep. Didn't appreciate you calling me out like that. Uh, I'm heaps sorry, mate. Heaps sorry. And mercy might be my, me sort of going, do you know what, buddy? That's okay. I forgive you. I'm not going to call the cops. Might still talk to the church about you being on elder candidates because it's a little bit dangerous, obviously, keying people's cars and losing it on a Sunday morning, of all things. But mercy might be I kind of let that go. Maybe I even take upon myself the cost. And sometimes we kind of think that that's grace. But grace is more radical than that. Grace is me coming to James and saying, hey, man, you, you keyed my car? But I'm going to pay for a brand new paint job on your car. Man, you must just, I don't know what's going on for you, but lovingly, buddy, I love you. I'm going to take you out for lunch. I'm going to give you a gift in response to your evil towards me. Please don't do that. (laughs) He's just, he's elbowing Rachel, like, get the keys. I'm going to get us a new paint job. I'm going to get us a new lunch. But grace is this radical response of returning good for evil, returning love for evil, returning love for hate. And it ends and splits the cycle and builds a different relationship. The grace transforms what is a, uh, a hateful situation into now a love situation. That's what the power of grace has to do. And so I want to talk about um, grace in three things because I think it's really important. The grace is more than just forgiveness of sins, and we understand that this morning. The grace includes our salvation, but grace is also about our transformation and as well as our participation in God's work. Salvation, transformation, participation, all gifts of God's kindness and love in our lives. So let's start with salvation. We've already looked at this scripture, and we know this, probably this verse particularly well. Ephesians 2, 8-9. to For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one can boast. I actually like the amplified version of it. I think it's um, really rich and brings out some of the concepts we've already began talking about. In the Amplified, it says, For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favour, drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, delivered from judgment, and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of your own selves, not your own efforts, but it's an undeserved gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempt to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for this salvation. That we are accepted and made acceptable, sheer gift, no works, is our salvation. But I think to really appreciate it, we have to back it up and take in that whole scripture that we began with. So starting from verse 1, let's have a look. Paul starts off by saying that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we once walked, following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan and his demons, which is the enemy of God. We were part of that group. The spirit now work in all the sons of disobedience, among whom you once lived, carrying out, yet once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Stop there for a moment. That's not really a great Instagram bio type scripture. It's not a bumper sticker, I'm a child of wrath, I follow the prince of the power of the air. But we have to sit in that for a moment. This is the reality, that our, our unregenerate hearts, apart from Christ in sin, that we are dead, dead in trespasses and sins. 
deserving of and rightfully under God's wrath. God, justice isn't a bad thing. God could display his justice and would be good in doing so in judging us to hell. And so the scripture says we sit under God's wrath by our works of our own, by our sinful nature, by our flesh, by in and of ourselves apart from Christ. That's where we were. But that's not the end of the scripture. Thank God. We were children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, he's not stingy in mercy, he is rich in mercy. Because of his great love, which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were keying his car, even when we were hating on him, even when we were disobedient to him and wanted nothing to do with him, made us alive with Christ. By grace, by this gift, sheer gift of favour, we are saved. We are raised up with him and seated in heavenly places so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. This idea that God, by this gift of grace, would move us from where we deserve, which is wrath, but by sheer gift, choosing not to be the ones which whom he displays his wrath and justice, moves us by sheer grace, by the work of Christ, into this place of his loving riches of kindness. That he's chosen to display not his wrath in us, but his kindness to us for the coming ages. So God has, by his work, decided, no, I'm going to put on display, regardless of what you've done, by the way, regardless of how you have acted and behaved, I've chosen you, Andre, to display to the coming ages how kind and gracious I am, is what God says. Because of his grace, not because of what you have or haven't done, your Bible reading plan sticking to that or your church attendance or whatever, but by sheer gift, God has decided, I want to show for the coming ages, for all of eternity, how kind, put on display my kindness and my grace and my love to you. That's, that's what I've chosen for all who trust in Christ. It's an incredible thing. So the idea that the wrath of God is satisfied completely in Christ by his death on the cross. And he gifts us, because we talked about the idea that grace isn't just responding with just forgiveness, but also gift. That in his love, he gifts us salvation. He gifts us eternal life. He gifts us um, complete acceptance. He gifts us gifts of his love and mercy and moves us from those who are worthy of punishment to those who are put on display for his love. When Christ was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father, Father, see that this cup may pass me if I can't drink this cup. Now, the cup, referring to the, the cup of God's judgment, which Christ drank in full when he was on the cross, meaning that there is not a drop of condemnation or judgment left to be poured out on any who receive Christ and his unbelievable gifts, which all is left to be displayed. For you and I is his kindness and goodness and love. That's why in Romans 8, Paul so gladly declares, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. Amen, indeed. Instead of an inheritance of judgment, we have an inheritance of the kingdom. The God in his goodness takes sinners and his enemies and adopts them as sons and daughters. These are the gifts of God's amazing grace. That's why Paul goes on in Romans 8 to exclaim, what then shall we say? If God is for us, who could be against us? He did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us. Will he not graciously give us all things? This is a too good to be true salvation. God's already bankrupt heaven in his love and giving to you. It's incredible. It's the most, God's response to our sin, his response to our rebellion is to give the most precious thing that he has, not based on our behavior and our works and our willingness or our status or our, um, how important we are in the world, sheer gift. 
His work is so complete, I think one of the best, uh, I know that, you know, encouraging kind of stories for me is when we think of the, the thief that was on the cross next to Christ. Um, when Christ was being crucified next to him were two thieves and, and just one looked to him and said, you know, Jesus, remember when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise because Christ's work was so complete. He didn't get baptised, he didn't take communion, there was no confirmation class, he didn't speak in tongues, he didn't go on a missions trip, he didn't volunteer at church, he didn't give any money to church, he had no church clothes, he didn't even say the sinner's prayer, he was a thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, didn't heal his body or smite his scoffers, yet it was the thief who walked into paradise the same hour simply by believing that Jesus was who he said he was because that work of Christ was so complete. And so our salvation is pure gift, pure grace, pure favour from God in response to our sin. I'll read the Amplified Version again because I just, I just think it's so great. For it is by grace you have been saved, God's remarkable compassion and favour that draws you to Christ. You have been saved, delivered from judgment, given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, it is undeserved, gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works or attempts to keep the law so that no one can boast. Salvation is by grace. It's incredible. I'm not sure if this is the level of like, this is what excitement looks like for you guys. It's totally cool if it is. But like, I think it's just an incredible thing that hope quickens your heart and, you, and restores your joy. Whatever condemnation you're sitting under, whatever sense of failure you may sit under, whatever kind of sense of like not good enough you sit under, you can be removed, you can let that go because Christ has completely fulfilled the law on your behalf. He's gifted you his righteousness. There is no punishment left for you because Christ on the cross has completely taken any wrath that was deserving of any of your actions is gone. That's worth saying amen to if you like. But that's not the end of it. So grace is not just about our salvation, but grace. It's important to understand that grace is also part of our transformation. You know, Paul was accused because Paul talked about this um, amazing, generous God who didn't treat people according to their sins. He was saying that you don't have to follow the law to be loved by God, that Christ has fulfilled it. And so he was accused of therefore promoting and enabling sin because the gospel is so good. What I want to say is that grace doesn't minimise sin. Grace doesn't enable sin. Grace doesn't permit sin. But grace does something more surprising than that, is that grace frees the world of sin by transforming sinners. The grace removes sin in two ways. By one, by putting it to death in Christ... And if you're in Christ, your sin has already been buried, punished, paid for, put to death. And then as we're risen to a new life, the grace is actually what transforms us. So we do not continue to sin. Paul's life is a like, perfect example of this. This beautiful, amazing, the powerful transformation act of grace. The Paul's a man who used his in- intellect and his influence to bring destruction to the church. He would persecute and kill Christians. And because his heart wasn't for Christ, he would bring death to the church and destruction to the church. The amazing thing about grace is that God God could have justly, when he encountered Paul, put him to death for his sin in that moment. That would be justice and that would still be good of God. But God decided to put his sin to death in a different way and met with Christ in love and completely transform his life. The incredible thing about grace is how it transforms those who are heading in one direction, putting, using their gifts for death to now using them for life. Paul says this about himself in 1 Timothy 13 to 16. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I'd acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of God overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying's trustworthy and deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost or the worst. 
I've received mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst of sinners may be put on display, God may put on display his perfect patience as an example of all those who believe. You know, grace wasn't this sort of safety net for Paul that if he maybe just backslid and every now and then killed a few Christians that he could just get forgiven for it. That wasn't how grace worked in his life. Grace is more powerful than that. Grace took the man who brought death to the church, transformed his heart, and he has been, probably in history, it's fair to say, the man who's brought most life to the church as far as human man, not Christ. That's the amazing transforming work of grace. That's all grace does. Not only did the grace of God turn Paul's heart around so he no longer persecuted the church, though he's so unworthy, the grace of God transformed him into a man who brought life into the church. History is littered with people like that. Some of you have heard of a man named Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was from the 1700s, and he was a cruel, cruel captain of a slave boat, um, doing horrific things, collecting slaves, taking their freedom, and bring about destruction. In fact, he was so cruel that even his uh, quite blasphemous shipmates, um, he would even make them blush by how cruel he was in his own words, Jonathan Edwards. Just going to find my little, my notes on my buddy Jonathan Edwards. In 1748, as a 22-year-old, Jonathan Edwards found himself in a storm, a storm in which, again, God, if he chose just justice, um, could have put an end to Jonathan Edwards' sin by letting him sink in a ship, and that would be just a just judgment and put an end to the destruction that Jonathan Edwards was wreaking havoc in people's lives with. Jonathan Edwards called out in in this storm for God's mercy, And God met him there, and he recognized that God met him there. Jonathan Edwards became a follower of Christ. God's grace was extended to Jonathan Edwards, and he was saved. He became a pastor. And Jonathan Edwards actually began, not only did he stop sinning, but he became became one of the foremost voices for the abolition of slavery. So much so that he actually befriended uh, William Wilberforce, um, if you're familiar with that name. And it was Jonathan Edwards who convinced William Wilberforce, a parliamentarian who himself wanted to see the end of slavery. And Jonathan Edwards was the one who convinced that he should stay in, for God's sake, parliament, to put at work this putting an end to slavery. Jonathan Edwards also wrote a book on his thoughts on the slave trade, which became like significant in terms of changing people's hearts and minds. It's incredible how God's Grace acted in this man's life, putting an end to his sin and then using him, rather than bringing death and destruction, the grace turned his life around. He became an administrator of God's grace to hurting people, to put an end to something so deathly and destructive. That's how that grace of work transformed people. You may know Jonathan Edwards more familiarly as the man who penned the song Amazing Grace. Jonathan Edwards called himself the great blasphemer because how he would speak of God. And it's incredible how the grace of God transformed his life that he penned one of the most grace-giving, life-giving, for centuries now, songs. That's how the grace of God transforms our life. The amazing way that the God's grace not only saves us, transforms us, but also calls us into participation. Paul and John Edwards are great examples of how these men who were Recipients of grace became givers of grace and God's life. I just want to finish off by talking about how God's grace overflows into our participation. The God's mission for his children in the world is to be administrators of God's grace. God doesn't call us to be take the, the bat of judgment, of condemnation. We do speak truth in love, absolutely. But through us, to show and bring his grace. So we would be the people, like in Bono's song, who lighten up every room that we walk into. 
that, that are rich in generosity because of God's grace in us. So we're rich in forgiveness because of grace in us. That we would disrupt the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth way of acting in the world is what God calls us to be as his grace agents in the world. Paul talks about this with his own life in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So it's it's the grace of God that both forgave him, the grace of God that transformed him. But he says, this grace towards me was was not in vain or without effect. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. It was not I, it was the grace of God with me. That Paul became a man on a mission to tell the world about the grace of God by the work of God's grace in his life. 1 Peter 4 verse 10. Peter the Apostle tells us this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve one another as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God has given each of you a gift with a great variety of spiritual gifts to use them with one another. This is the idea that God's grace, yes, is in salvation. Yes, God's grace is in transformation. But this is why we love discipleship groups. This is why the church is an exciting place because there is a, a grace that God wants to give through your life. There's a grace that God has both gifted you with and that he wants to share or flow over into others his grace in a special way through your life that we get to participate as God's children in giving grace to the world and bringing life to others. And this is through God's various spiritual gifts. We're blessed regularly by our worship leaders, by our servers, by our people with the gift of encouragement, by the people who are gift of hospitality. This is a grace. And people get to receive and experience God's grace. And it's why we would so passionately ask you to to engage in the life of the church because there is a grace gifted to you that you can give to the rest of us. And so we, as a family, experience God's grace through one another, which is an incredible thing, a beautiful thing. And this, I would say, includes the spiritual gifts. And I'd love to just finish by sharing um, a bit of a testimony from one of our students at school. So um, we've got some students that run like an incredible worship night. They're amazingly gifted as... Worshippers, and it's one of the greatest kind of worship time we have. In fact, I think it's next Saturday night. Little plug, little timely plug. Next Saturday night, our students, 6 p.m. at Enjoy Church. Church. Incredible young people just put on a night of worship. And um, and we're on the way to this night of worship. And I'm always really excited because it's just a great time with Jesus. And we're even... Jesus' presence, um, kind of uninterrupted for about an hour and a half of just, just pure worship. It's just a just, just beautiful time with him. And I remember on the way there, I was praying and sort of asking God, God, I just want to have another experience of your love. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church, and I, um, I remember when I got saved, had this, you know, heard the gospel, responded to the gospel, and then was praying and asking God that I would encounter his love. Because I was like, I, I know in word you love me, God, but something, I just, I don't know. I don't, still don't feel loved. I'm still so aware of my flaws. I'm so aware of my insecurities. And I don't, I don't really know how else to explain it apart from after praying this sort of similar prayer of God, is there some way I can experience your love? Because I didn't really know what the rules were and weren't around that time. I was a very new believer. But being at work in my, in my room in the middle of the night, and all I could say is I knew. I knew that I knew that I knew that I was loved from my soul and so we're driving and I've sort of had this conversation in my heart with God of like God why haven't I had that experience again I want that experience again and just a thought for me that came I don't know what language you use around whether or not it's God or my own thought but it's this thought of do you know what that was an infilling of the love of God and that love has never left I don't need to have another sort of like that. It was great to have different encounters with the love of God. And immediately after that, the thought came from God that now the encounter of, of my love is as you pass my love to others. That's, that's how you encounter my love now. The love's already in you, so you'll encounter it afresh as you pass on my love to others. And my mind straight away went to one of our um, beautiful worship leaders, a girl named Kyla. 
Um, and I just had this thought. I knew that she had chronic pain in her legs from when she was younger, chronic knee issues. Um, she was so, like, still upbeat and, and a lovely girl. But I just had this radical, crazy thought that the God of grace would want to meet her in her grace and would want to touch and heal her body. And I said to Lisa, and I'm, and I'm not kind of the person that would, it's probably the only time I've done this, maybe. I don't know. I'm a little bit crazy, but I'm not a kind of constant God told me person. But I said to Lisa, God's going to heal Kyla tonight. Couldn't take those words back. Put them out there. <clears throat> but during the worship time, I just knew I had to go to Kyla. There's these times with prayer and I knew, man, we've, we've got to pray for Kyla. This poor girl suffered so long with his knee issues. And so I grabbed a bunch of girls so they could lay hands on her. I said, let's, let's pray for Kyla. I want to read in her words, her experience of God's grace that night. This is from a post that she put after that night about the worship night and what happened. She said, These nights have always been the most incredible experience, getting to minister to hundreds of people through what I love most. That's singing. But this one I'll never forget. As we went to the time of prayer, Jace McPhee came over, asked if he can pray for my knees. I've had unresolved chronic pain since I was 11. Having him pray for healing and especially having the girls around me put their hands on my knees left felt a little bit weird at first, but far out it was worth it. Partway through the, through the prayer, everything changed. I physically felt a massive weight lifted off of me. I immediately felt relief rush into my body. All the pain was gone, not just in my knees, in my headaches, in the muscle aches. It just disappeared. I stood in shock for a while. And it took me a few hours to really process it all. In bed that night, I sat there, tears streaming down my face. In absolute awe of just how good God is. It was one of the most faith-strengthening experiences in my life. I woke up this morning, no pain. At all. Something that I haven't felt for so long without pain relief. I will never stop telling this testimony. The God's grace to us in salvation. We are completely free from any condemnation, chosen and saved. And then God's grace that transforms us so that once we were those who would minister death through our sin now become ministers of life. And then God's grace in participation that as God wants to touch and love His people and His world and share His testimony and word of grace. And it is all grace. The beautiful thing that church, that God both graces us with these gifts, my had nothing to do with my hours or lack of hours praying or anything like that. I was actually feeling quite kind of like distant maybe from God, you could say at the time. I was sort of, man, maybe I'm not reading my Bible enough. Type space in my heart uh, when God did that. But there's grace. That's why we don't ever hold people above anyone else. It's all grace. It's all grace. As we kind of just sort of wrap up, I just... I know that God is gracious and we all come with need. And perhaps for you this morning, there's need. Maybe need for encouragement, need for something to lift, need to be refreshed with His love, maybe need for healing. Maybe just need to lay down sin, let Christ put it to death and so that He can give you a gift of grace. You know, the... When we rationalise and justify and minimise our sin, rather than bring it to Christ to be forgiven, what we're doing is shortcutting the process so grace can work in us. Can I encourage you if you're battling, struggling, justifying sin in your life, this is a word of love, just let Jesus kill it. He wants to put life in the place of sin. He wants to bring love through you. And so if there's a need, I'm going to ask you to do maybe something a little bit different. 
Um, but we're family here. And we're all here because we've recognised that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so maybe we shouldn't be embarrassed, hopefully not too much, recognising that we have a need. Um, but have you got a need? Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's just an encouragement. Would you be so bold as to maybe stand in this moment that the God of grace can meet us if you've got a need? Yeah. Anyone else, if you feel like, yeah. I don't know about you, but I'll take all of the grace of God that he has to offer for me. Here's what I love for us to do in this moment is that not only is God a uh, God of grace, but he wants to use his grace through you. And so if you're hard, if you've got maybe compassion in your heart for some of these people standing, um, can I encourage females, move towards females, males, move towards males. But let's just have just a moment where we let God's grace minister to us and through us to these people.